Oh, baby, it's time. Rings of Power Season 2 is here, and as with Season 1, I decided to cover all of the episodes. It's been a while since Season 1 came around, so before I get into Episode 1, I will do a little recap for all of you non-crazy people out there that did not bother to rewatch Season 1. We had a couple of main threads that we followed, and I will start with good old Galadriel. Whatever you know about her from the original trilogy, Forget about it. This is thousands of years before that, and she's the commander of the Northern Armies, leading them against Morgoth. The, she's like the big bad back then. They do the big old fighting, and then her brother gets killed during the search for Morgoth's servant, Sauron. You know, the, the big eye? He's not an eye yet, he's the deceiver man or something. I don't know, I don't know the deep lore of Lord of the Rings, I'm just a peasantly movie watcher, alright? He ends up having a mark on his corpse, which leads Galadriel to believe that Sauron is still out there, and even after the actual war against Morgoth is over, she takes some soldiers and keeps searching for the big bad orky boys for a very long time. They end up finding some old ruins, which has the same mark as her brother, which she counts as reinforcing a position to keep the search going. Her companions think that's cringe and they want to go home after all this time, and after they kill some ice troll, her companions basically lay down their swords and force her to go home. Back home they get the highest honor that elves can get, which is sailing to Valinor where they can chill and have a great time for the rest of eternity. Of course Galadriel isn't hyped about this because she's certain evil is still out there. The thing is except these small hints, an achy tummy and having a feeling she's right, she really doesn't have anything to go by to convince anyone that there's still evil out there. Obviously she's gonna be right in the end, but the thing is that her arguments are all based on what she feels. Or basically goes, do trust me. And I'm not talking about magical evil detection fields like you would expect from the elves. It's basically a hunch, and she goes off of it. Oh. Ooh. I think I'm getting a clue. Really? I'm starting to get a clue, too. My clue's kind of pointing this way. While well, Elrond, for example, tells her that she can't just keep sending elves into their death, or finding the sigil doesn't mean she is any closer to finding Sauron, even if he exists. So she does the only thing that makes sense which is jumping off the boat that sails to Valinor and starts swimming to Middle-earth. Yeah, that's right, she just... She, she just starts swimming. Don't worry, she's lucky, she finds some random shipwreck survivors after an amount of time. I, I don't know how long, she must have been going for a while because she's really thirsty and exhausted, which also leads me to believe that there's no way she would have made it, but... Anyway, we get introduced to Hellbrand and also the elf racism or whatever. They get attacked by a big sea monster, and Hellbrand uses the other survivors as bait, so he survives. Galadriel got shoved off before they got eaten, and then Hellbrand helps her on his little raft, and they kind of survive together for a while. A storm approaches, uh, where Galadriel gets dragged underwater for a while, but <laughs> don't worry about it, because everybody knows you can't stick unconsciousness and drowning, so you're fine for long enough to get saved. Yeah, I'm saying she should be dead and full of water. They pass out, and again, a lot of luck here. They get picked up by a random ship, captained by Elendil. The ship is headed back home to Numenor, a city that was gifted to the humans by the elves. But over time the humans started to resent the elves and there's like a whole strange relationship going on. It's actually pretty comical, because Galadriel is the first elf that arrived here for a very long time, and the citizens basically immediately go like, Oh no, we're going to take my jobs! Ships on our shore! Elf workers! Taking your trades! Workers! Who don't sleep, don't tire, don't age. They are here for a while, and Helbrin actually wants to stay and start a new life, but Galadriel finds out that the mark she saw on her brother is actually a map of the Southlands. She basically forces Helbrin to come with them, because he has the mark of the long-lost king of the Southlands, so he can reunite and rule them, and everyone will be cool with it. As already said, Heron doesn't really want to go, but he decides to come after all. Galadriel convinces Miriel, the de facto ruler of Numenor, that they both have knowledge of stuff and no one believes them, so they should work together, and so they do. They end up making their way to the Southlands, and uh, coincidentally, exactly go to this little village they are currently fighting in, even though they have no idea this is currently happening and are not riding anywhere else in the Southlands, or just took a little different route. They have no idea this is happening, but they arrive there just in time. This this shit has so many coincidences and luck involved. Jesus. To be fair, they might have seen some smoke on the horizon or found some corpses along the way in other villages and made their way to the fight that is currently happening. But then again, it's still very lucky that they made it just in time to save the day. 
On top of that, I have to wonder why Muriel told Elendil to make all possible haste, even though she's not aware there's any fighting happening. I guess it makes for a cool shot, but without that command, they would have never made it. They saved the day and capture Adar, so he can't use the evil sword key. But it was all a clever ruse, because he sent Waldrag to use the key and make Mount Doom explode in order to create Mordor. So yeah, everyone gets exploded by a, by a pyroclastic flow, and the show ends. Just kidding, this thing only hurts extras. Main characters get a little ash and dust on them, and otherwise they're fine. Like, look look at this. There's a horse on fire, and a, and a person, and houses. It's crazy. She just looks at the ash approach, doesn't take any cover, and she just gets dirty while there's houses on fire and shit. The only one that gets damaged is Miriel, who turns blind after trying to help someone. Which is still kind of funny, because after the pyroclastic flow, she was fine. After they all regroup at the Numenorian camp, Miriel and her surviving troops sail back to Numenor, promising to return with an army in the future. Galadriel learns that Helrin has been injured and realizes that he needs elvish healing, and they ride six days without rest to get to Erigio, Erig, er, this city. Six days without rest? I guess you could say Sauron would be able to survive this if I'm being charitable. The horses, though? Mm, no, you can throw them in the bin after you're done. Those are horses of the men of Numenor and not elvish magic horses. No way they would be able to make this trip that fast. Helbrand recovers and has a talkie with Celebrimbor and tells him they should try to use different materials to amplify the little mithril they have, which ends up being the solution on making the rings of power. In the meantime, Galadriel finally decides to check Helbrand's family tree, because she, he's been kind of sussy-wussy here. Or rather, she checks the royal bloodline of the crest and realizes that this bloodline has been broken a long time ago and that there hasn't been an heir at all since then. When Galadriel finally confronts him, he reveals that he is Sauron and sims for Galadriel, because she has been nice to him, basically. Telling him that the past doesn't matter, and only what you do from now on counts and you should just do good. I don't know why Sauron thinks she would join him, and maybe this is just another tactic of his to corrupt her. But he goes on to tell her that she's the only one to see her light, and, and he's gonna make her his queen. Ugh, cringe. Anyway, she gets knocked out after refusing to be an evil overlord, and Sauron goes to Mordor, and that's the main story beats Dunzo. But obviously, there's more, because during all of that, we have the Southland storyline happening. The Elves have been keeping watch since the humans joined Morgoth back in the day, so they need supervision. We mainly follow Arondir and Bronwyn, who have also a romantic interest in each other, but that's not the main focus. The Elven King has deemed the war over, and the Elves get noticed that they can return home. But on like the same day, where Arondir is basically like, Yo Bronwyn, I gotta go home. A farmer comes around because she's like the village healer, and she's like, yo, do you also heal animals? When they see that the cow has black goop coming out of his udders, Arandir asks him, okay, where could this cow might have gone? Like, oh, maybe all the way up to this random village up there. Bronwyn and Arandir go and check out the village. They find it completely destroyed and currently burning. Instead of telling the elves that surely won't just leave without checking where one of their own is, Arandir decides to check out the tunnels that have been dug and gets captured by orcs. Anyway, the Southland Elves don't come up again. I guess they just left. It gets even more awkward because the Orcs kept multiple Elves and I guess no one checked where they were. So Arondir gets forced to dig trenches alongside other people, which is massive by the way, and the Elves somehow didn't find it. They tried to make a case that they used the tarps and rags to hide it, but nah. Look how big that thing is, and Elves have crazy good vision. You're trying to convince me they missed this? Nah, you gotta do better than that. Anyway, he tries to escape with more elves, but they get killed, except for Arondir. He gets to talk to Adar, who's the orc's daddy. He tells him that he should bring the people a message. Join him or die. He delivers the message to the surviving villagers, and it's basically half and half, where half of them say, oh, I'm gonna take the deal, and half of them stay to fight. They end up fighting the orcs and hold their own until the Numenorian army comes to save them. But right before that, Theo, who's Bronwyn's son, gives up the location of the evil sword hill to save his mother which Adar needs to open the dam. There's like a whole thing going on with the sword that he finds and trying to hide, and then Waldrag being like, Ooh, you like the evil arts? Ooh, I'm gonna be creepy and old. Before the Numenorean armies arrive, Ada does a little switcheroo and sends Waldrag to open the floodgates with the sword, which opens the dam into the tunnels, which makes Mount Doom explode and turns the Southlands to Mordor. The survivors of the Southlands decide to go to an old Numenorean settlement to rebuild and have a fresh start. Okay, uh, who else do we have? And yes, I'm trying to not talk about the stupid Harfords because I hate them. Oh yeah, Elrond and Durin. 
basically kill a Brimbor, a legendary elven smith needs to build a big old new forge for smithing, but he can't do it on his own. So Elrond gets the task to go to the dwarves because he's a friend of Durin, who is currently the prince. But because Elrond sucks, he hasn't been visiting his friend for 20 years, and Durin is the big mad. Rightfully so. They eventually make up, but there's always mistrust, especially from the king, that they came for something else and not just his cooperation to build the forge. He ends up being right, even though Elrond only finds out about that later, because he was basically sent in blind and was meant to figure out if they found Mithril or not. Which they did find. The reason the elves need Mithril is that their big life tree is withering away, and Mithril is the only option they have to stop it. If they don't stop it, they have to perish with the tree or leave the shores of Middle-earth for good. They try to make a deal, but the king is like, nah, everyone's gonna die at some point, the elves are not gonna cheat death. Which makes Durin big mad. So he takes Elrond and goes digging anyway. That makes the king big mad, but Elrond snatches a small piece while they're digging, which they end up using to make the brings of power in Eregion. I guess I gotta talk about the stupid Arfoots now. Listen, these little dinguses are psychopaths, dude. The story is mostly disconnected from the rest, but it will likely connect with the others in Season 2. They're definitely not hobbits, are wandering folk who keep hidden from everyone and go on their trails every season. Nori is a typical, oh man, traditions are so boring, I want to see the world kind of character. And of course everyone else is like, no, we've been doing this for thousands of years, it's great. The stranger falls from the heavens and he's got weird magic powers and he helps him learning to talk and feeds him. All to the dismay of the rest of the Harfords when they find out. It's teased that he is Sauron by showing him do stuff that looks destructive, but actually heals things and stuff like that. But in the end he says that in their tongue he's called a wizard, and I think he's gonna be Gandalf, but we shall see. Anyway, at some point Eminem comes around and is like, yo, you are Sauron, but with the power of friendship, Nori tells him that no, you're not evil just because they tell you to. And then they defeat them and they go on their own adventure, which is most likely gonna end up in Mordor or close to it. Anyway, the Harfords suck. They have the slogan, nobody goes off trail and nobody walks alone which they even have like a little ceremony or dance about. And then we hear in the same episode that they leave people behind when they get stuck in the snow and make fun of you post-mortem when you die because of bees. They're also really gross in general, I hate them. And that's where we're currently at with the main threats. There's much more to go into, and I did talk about these episodes a bit more in detail on Metal's Forge, so feel free to go check those out. But with that, we're pretty much caught up and I will be able to dive into Season 2. Jumping into the first episode, we get Sauron's path to the raft. We see Sauron trying to convince the orcs that he is their only hope to victory now that Morgoth is dead. He says that the Valar will never forgive them, the elves never accept them, and humans think they are stinky and gross and will only ever slaughter them. Many orcs will die, but it is a necessary sacrifice to victory. So this might be interesting to keep in mind. This is a different actor that plays this version of Sauron. So they are aware that this is a concept they can use. Makes me wonder why they get the same actor later as a different version of the Seaver Sauron. But we shall see. In any case, the orcs are not convinced. One tries to stab him from behind, fails and gets stabbed quite a bit. Seriously man, calm down, jeez. Adar is also present and he grabs the evil crown that pretends that he accepts Sauron, but stabs him with the pointy ends and all the orcs come to slaughter him. Again, geez, going strong with the violence here. Whew. I mean, I don't mind violence in my media, just got me off guard. Adar checks if he's dead, and Sauron's body explodes into ice that reaches pretty far. Apparently ice doesn't really do any damage except knocking people out, and they all get up and the orcs accept Adar as their new ruler. If I got my brain juices together properly, I guess he wasn't fond of more orc sacrifices. Seeing that the orcs basically see him as a father figure, I guess that checks out? But of course Sauron isn't dead dead. He drips down in the ground, this black goop. He exists as a puddle for a while and eats rodents and insects until he can fleam around to the surface. He flops his goopy wormy self onto the road and waits until some random lady runs him over and becomes the last snack that enables him to have a human form again. Making his way to where the orcs are, presumably wanting to try to take over again, he stumbles across this random old man that has the king's crest he had in season 1. The old guy tells him that his family served that old king and it's a reminder that things can change in a whim even for the most powerful beings. He offers him to not go towards death but follow them to just start anew to where they are going. Sauron has a little think and ends up with them, meaning getting on a ship on which they get attacked by the big sea creature, destroying the boat, Helbrin taking the crest from the old man and ending up in the water. It seems the creature recognizes his power and leaves him alone, which makes you wonder why it even attacked their raft in season 1 in the first place. Ending the scene, we see Galadriel arriving at the raft. The fact Sauron and Galadriel even met in the first place is kinda crazy. The chances were pretty low in season 1 already, but we made the chances even lower now. 
The fact Galadriel randomly finding the raft after jumping off the boat is crazy enough, but now think about Sauron's journey. He could have taken longer to eat some rodents, he could have left through a different hole to the surface, he, he could have taken longer to find a human victim. The horse of the carriage could have not ran away. He could have not met the old man, which means he would have never gotten on the boat. He could have not been randomly attacked by the sea creature. The damn wind could have blown differently and made them go in another direction on the raft. It's so many factors it becomes pretty hard to believe that they even met in the first place. Galadriel is chasing Elrond who has taken the rings. She ends up getting stopped by elven guards and they meet up with the High King. The High King is asking if it's true that she has not told Celebrimbo and Elrond about Hellbrand and who he might be. She tries to talk around it and the High King gets annoyed and tells her to spit it out already. And still, she's like, he's no man. He only made himself look fair. Yada yada, just tell them already. Even though she does end up telling them he is Sauron, there was still this whole part of her trying to make herself look better. I didn't mean any harm, and I wouldn't only put the elves in danger. Man, you would think the commander of the northern armies has some more urgency and would be less selfish. It's even weirder because she has been portrayed as getting everything done no matter what people think of her so far, but now she's so embarrassed she wouldn't tell him. Anyway. Aaron makes the point that they can't use the rings because Hellbrand might have corrupted them. Oh, hey, editing metal here. I just realized while redrafting the edit that one of the reasons that Galadriel believes the rings aren't corrupted is that Sauron never came in contact with the rings. And while it might be true that he wasn't involved in the making of the rings, he totally had contact with this mithril. See, right here. Meaning Elrond is even more justified to not trust the rings. Why didn't Sauron do anything here? I don't really have an answer and that might be a plot point later, but yeah, just wanted to share that. Back to, uh me, I guess. Bye! Also with Sauron on the rise again, he tells Elrond that they have no other choice at all now. The High King gets so annoyed he gets a scolding finger out and tells him that this is not his decision to make, but Elrond jumps off a cliff into the waters below and that's that. Also that might just be me, but the finger up scolding gesture just seems so unelvish to me. You have been naughty Mr. Elrond, give me the rings! Time to check on Sauron who has turned himself in to Adar. Obviously he has a different form now from back then when you knew him, so he doesn't recognize him. It's so funny how they portray Adar as evil, because there's this big line of people and every single one of them needs to kneel before Adar or he gets stabbed. And they need to do it quickly, otherwise there's this orc coming from the side who stabs you to death instantly. It's like, oh that was one second too long. Yeah! But forget about that, the legend is back! Waldrek is here and he got a promotion. He's now the slave master of the prisoners or something. Man, he got armor and everything. What a lad, pressing the button to create mortar and now he's got a job. Absolute legend. So basically Sauron is still playing the long lost king role here and tells Adar that he should let his people go or his will die and that he has some very important information of a certain sorcerer. Adar tells him that he defeated all of the enemies they had to fear, including the elves that came to the aid for men. Defeated? I guess. They didn't find your big trench and thought you were gone and then they left. They also didn't bother to check for all the elves you captured, so they never tried to stop you for some reason. I mean, yeah, I guess that would count as a defeat for the elves, but... But man, that makes the elf look pretty bad. Damn. Sauron tells him that after Galadriel's defeat, she looked for a new ally, and he gave them the power over the flesh. Of course he is talking about himself, but he basically tries to convince Adar that she got the help of Sauron. But he doesn't fully buy it yet, and puts Sauron into prison and lets Waldrick torture him. In other news, the stranger, or wizard I guess, and Nori been traveling. He has been having some dreams about a staff and when he touches it he sees evil things and stuff. On top they seem to be followed by someone with an evil skull mask. Nori complains that they ran out of food and tells the wizard to at least try to conjure some berries from the tree. But he reminds her what happened last time and is worried it'll happen again. I don't know if they refer to something that happened off screen, but last time we saw him try, a branch came loose and almost hurt someone of the Harfoots. Not really his fault, as everyone was super close when it happened, so if they talk about that, they should definitely try again. Which they do. Anyway, he tries and the tree explodes, but luckily it's full of bugs so they can eat those. Nori loves that, by the way. The wizard is like, Ugh, I can feel legs in my throat. And Nori says, that's the best part. It's like they're dancing in their throats and they sang songs about it. Ooh. Brother, ooh. Why do they make the Harfoots as gross as possible all the time? Psychos. Anyway, she's sad about leaving behind her friends and family, and the wizard has a glimpse of his home as well, so he's kind of sad too. The scene ends with him noticing a campfire in the distance, realizing they have been followed. Well, let's see what happens next. Not much. Sauron gets beat up by Waldrag and then uses the dark speech to tame the creature that's chained in here as well. Also an unexpected jump scare, like the one that has ooh, loud noise and shock sound. 
Elven time! We're now in Linden, where Elrond is hiding from the other elves and meets up with Círdan, one of the oldest and wisest elves. In the meantime, the High King sends message to Celebrimbor that Hellbrand is Sauron and they extend the search for Elrond and the rings. So, you know there's this threat of Sauron in Eregion, possibly tempting him to make more rings for him and doing all kinds of evil. And you send random McElf over here to bring the message. This is the guy you've been scared of for so long and he's possibly in one of your big cities and you send a little messaging squad? You know you have more people, right? You have like armies and everything. If you don't send any of your commanders, send a whole bunch of soldiers over there to deal with this. You assume he has no army yet, but who knows what he has been out to. Maybe you need to reclaim the city. If I'd be the High King, I wouldn't take any chances and send a bunch of people over there. And if you don't want to send Galadriel, send some other captain or commander. You have plenty of peeps to choose from. Oh well, I'm sure nothing goes bad with that messenger squad. Also, good luck finding one guy with the rings when you miss this big trench and scorch trees for, I don't know, years. Elrond talks to Círdan and tells him that this might all be a greater ploy by Sauron that they don't know yet, and the rings must be destroyed in order to not fall to the enemy's ploy, even if it means abandoning Middle-earth and its people for good. Which seems to convince Círdan basically immediately and he's off to yeet the rings. Okay, that was easy. The High King and his entourage go to Círdan's shop because Galadriel suspects that Elrond would seek out someone that is wise and would even be able to sway the High King. To Galadriel's credit, she actually made a guess based on things she knew. Good on you! She begs him to come peacefully, but Elrond asks what makes her so sure that the rings are free of corruption. Because in my heart, I know the three rings are free of his influence. <sighs> oh, I just started getting a clue. Really? Yeah, I'm totally getting a clue. I know you even tried to convince him that Sauron wasn't involved in the making of the ring, and that's why you think they aren't corrupted at all? No? Fine. At least Aaron doesn't take it, because he follows with wondering if she is maybe corrupted, because she turned away from the light of the Valar. Maybe she's part of the plan already, even if she doesn't know yet. She says that she did what she felt was right. Yeah, that's why you haven't convinced anyone about anything so far, but the movie bent backwards for you to be right in the end, so why try something else at this point? But anyway, he has bought enough time and Círdan is on his way to heat the rings. Nori and the wizard ambush to follow up, but it's not actually any of the evil peeps, it's Poppy! Yay! Hooray, another Harford! Ugh. What was that trap anyway? I think it's supposed to be a tripwire, but it's just connected to a rock and it looks really loose. That would just move. But Poppy drops anyway. They throw a blankie over her and they're about to smash her head in. <laughs> Which I would like. Great. We needed her because the two are lost and she looked at Sadok's old book and figured out that this has been a Harford trail a long time ago. And the song she sang in season 1 is actually Directions to Rune. And that leads them straight there. Wow, how convenient and cool and satisfying. Anyway, their actual pursuers are still there, watching them. Back to the elves, we see Círdan is about to yeet the rings into the depths. But a little stronger wave hits his boat, and he trips right before he can throw them off. Which opens the back a little, and he gets them out to look at them. And this is gonna not make him do it, because he realizes the power of the rings. Are you kidding me? You're kidding me, right? Again with the convenient BS? Hellbrand happens to meet the old man. Galadriel happens to get picked up by the raft. They happen to get picked up to get to Numenor. They happen to get to the village where Arondir is just in time. Everybody happens to not get injured by a pyroclastic wave. And now Círdan happens to get hit by a wave that happens to make him take the rings out of the pouch which makes him reconsider. What an absolute joke. In any case, Adar set the people of the king free and demands the information he promised him about Sauron in return. Helbrand tells him that Sauron has returned in a new form, but he doesn't know which one yet. But he has the trust of the elves and he will go seek him out. In the meantime, Adar can rally his troops. Waldrick asks him if he'd kneel to Adar and makes him put his head in the dirt and vows his life to the Lord of Mordor. Man, Waldrick loves his job. He makes his way to the elves, but Adar makes sure he gets followed. Also, Sauron made the beast from the cell kill Waldrick. No! Rip to the legend. Back with the elves, the High King is telling everyone that they have to leave Middle-earth for good. But Círdan comes back with the rings, one of them on his finger, and gives the other two to the High King. When Elrond yells, he drops the two rings, and one of them lands in front of Galadriel. So obviously she puts it on and gets to keep it. If this would be the Galadriel from the movies, I wouldn't doubt a second that she would be the first wearer of a ring of power. But this Galadriel? She has been nothing but antagonistic towards her friends, the people of Númenor, and the High King. She even directly went against him and his orders, which sounds like treason to me. Same with Elrond, by the way. He caused them so much annoyance by running away with the rings. I wonder what his repercussions are gonna be for that. But I digress. The ring also just falls right in front of her and she just puts it on and no one is bothered by it at all. Which is weird because of the aforementioned reasons. I mean, what about other commanders of the army? Aren't they cool enough to be considered? 
Where are they anyway? Galadriel is always around the hiking. Oh, they're probably busy taking care of her army because she's never around. But then I wonder, why is she even called a commander anymore? She was supposed to be chilling with the Valar and not be here anymore. Shouldn't someone else be a commander by now? Has that person been demoted as soon as the old commander of the Defeated King's Orders came back? Kind of screwed up. Oh well. And that's that. Pretty slow episode overall that leads to a pretty rushed end with the Rings of Power getting on the fingers of the elves already. Didn't expect that so early. Elrond who caused this annoyance for possibly multiple days just seems to chill with everyone like nothing happened. I wonder if that's gonna be mentioned at all. We made the meeting of Galadriel and Helbrand even more unlikely by adding a lot more conveniences. We still have the problem where it's really hard to keep track of past time in the show and then jumping around to different places. It's, it's really confusing. Nori, Poppy and the Stranger still seem super disconnected from the rest of the story. So yeah, nothing much to say in conclusion here at the moment. And that's all I have to say for now. So I will see you for episode 2, which is already out. Because they released three episodes at once because they hate me. Oh well. Thanks for watching.